Welcome to a very exciting episode of Design and Build. Why is it exciting you ask? Well, we are revealing the next full build for the channel, which is another ground up build. It's been over 12 months now since Barra 45 was registered and even longer since the last build episode. I'm not in a rush to start a new build because I'm really content with the car and enjoying using it. And there are more trip videos of the car in action coming up on the channel. This build isn't for me, it's actually for my neighbor and good friend George. And I think it's really important to set the scene and formally introduce George to the channel because we're in this for the long haul. In this episode, we're gonna hear about George's background the very interesting story about how we met and how we got to this point. Finally, George will be telling you about the plan for the build which is underway at the moment. Just a reminder that the merch pre-order is still open, so if you'd like to support the channel and see it grow, make sure you grab a t-shirt, hoodie or work shirt or even some stickers. Cheers, really appreciate it. So my name's George, but most of you may know me as BarraGU or Unimog Docker on Instagram. I'm actually a plumber by trade, but when I'm not working or being a hubby and, and a dad, I actually enjoy a lot of my time spending it wheeling and camping. So I've had a heap of four-wheel drives, uh, cars ranging from you know BMW, high-powered street drift cars, and also own a 200 series Land Cruiser and a couple of Unimogs. Mum and Dad were both car nuts, so quite naturally ran through to me and my brothers. I have fond memories of Dad's XB Coupe and that's probably where it all started for me being a car guy. My first car was an 84 model BMW 3 Series. I did what any other kid would do with their first car and threw in a you know, sound system, uh, subwoofers, rims, lowered it and all that jazz. Uh, pretty much drove that thing like it was stolen. And I did actually own a 1969 XE Falcon that I was willing to do a full restore on it up until recently, but then I did sell that just to fund this actual build. In regards to four drives, pretty much uh, they used to be just a mean of transport for me uh, when I used to ride a lot of dirt bikes back in the day. Before we knew it, we all needed four drives to sort of get to some really pretty awesome camp spots or weekends away. So having a four-wheel drive gave us the opportunity to get to the best spots. I know it's quite laughable, but my first 4x4 was a 94 model Triton. As they say, you know, Mitsubishi just can take you anywhere except 300 yards from your nearest primary school. I decided one day to buy a new one before I went over to Fraser Island in 2012. That was a 2012 uh, Triton with a couple of mods thrown on it. What happened to the Triton on Fraser, George? Went up there and checking out some pretty awesome places on the island. I believe it was second last day. Cousin and I were trying to get to the furthest most northern point of the island on the west side and fighting the tides coming you know all the way back down we were just going through the actual crossings you know checking all the depths and all that stuff but on this one occasion I walked through got to about the halfway mark and thought it was going back down and didn't check the other end of the bank should have checked that bank so as I come up to the exit it was a uh, Pretty much a washed out, uh, washed out bank. So every time I was hitting it, it was like a sandbar on the end there. Couldn't reverse out because my rear bar was hitting it and it was a pretty narrow sort of crossing. But literally it was a sitting duck, water had come in, wet the ECU, and that was the end of the vehicle. It was 28 days old. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, look, it was a very expensive lesson all that, that day and pretty much ate a rather large slice of humble pie. Uh, you know, uh, from that day on, I literally carried a lot of, you know, that experience with me every time I go out on the tracks to this day. So it was, uh, yeah, a bit of a learning curve. Tell us about <laughs> oh. Barra GU. I got my hands on Barra GU, I think it was around 2015. She had over half a million Ks on the clock, still, you know, still sported the original TV45 engine and the RE4 automatic. She was old, slow and thirsty. My intentions at the time were to throw an LS in it. They were all the rage back in the day. I'm glad I kind of did it now, to be honest. Yeah, but screw I, GM, mate. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> I, uh, I was convinced by the tune shop at the time to go a barra. I literally didn't know what a barra was. I said to him, you know, what on earth is a barra? And uh, pretty much the rest is history. Before I knew it, I ended up pumping into it way too much money or more than I care to sort of admit. And you'll never find out. I know you're always going to be asking me during this build, but I'm never actually going to admit it. So <laughs> you'll probably try and catch me out a few times. I think I had about close to 700 uh, horsepower at the hubs. Look, the truth of the matter is, you know, there were more lows than highs in that car. Uh, it was pretty much a disaster after disaster waiting to happen in it. It was very unreliable, but unfortunately, I just kept throwing a lot of money on it, trying to achieve uh, my dream of owning a vehicle that I can, you know, take out cruising on a Friday night against some, you know, pretty unsuspecting, uh, you know, fast cars 
And then on the weekend, when my mates give me a call up, I'd throw the 37s on, mix it up with some you know, seriously modified comp trucks. Uh, besides the reliability issues with Barrage U, uh, she was a well set up rig. She had all the fruit on it. So your twin lockers, 37s, bead locks, twin motor, you know, 24 volt winch. The motor uh, was built. It was running a 67 mil pro charge turbo, water methanol in uh, injection system. And although it wasn't much to look at, it did go like a cut snake. Barra GU was probably that one car that sort of got me into the four wheel drive scene properly. And it did give me the opportunity to meet some pretty awesome friends who I obviously have lifelong friendships with uh, till today. I did some pretty awesome trips in the rig. One of my memorable ones would most probably be Tasmania when I did it with Damo and uh, Terra Jago or Peter. Tell us about Outback 2018. For those of you that don't actually know what that is, it's literally a long course event, which is seven days unsupported, tough wheeling through the Australian Outback. Jimmy was looking to fill uh, the nav Navi seat and obviously me having a rubber arm, I decided why not and jumped at the opportunity. I actually knew absolutely nothing about winch truck challenge events. So for those of you that sort of do want to get into the sport, don't feel intimidated by it. I mean, everyone obviously starts it somewhere and I haven't done too many events myself. I think I've done, we've, I've, I've done two of them only, I think, but I look forward to getting back out there and racing again someday soon. I'd honestly have to say that when I did race Outback, it was one of those events that actually got me hooked into four wheel drive winch challenge. And if you are a four wheel driver and love being out four wheel driving with your mates, there's no better feeling than being in a race truck with you and a mate in the middle of the outback competing in a winch truck challenge event. You, your mate and all your clothes, your food, your drinks and all your spares are all, all on board. And your goal is to just make it through the entire week to get to the finish line. So it's a big achievement just doing that in itself. Jimmy and I were actually doing pretty decent, but unfortunately on the last day we had a ball to jump out in front of us. It wasn't, wasn't our fault, which pretty much you know, ruined the vehicle and we called, called quits from there onward. Kind of did leave me hungry for more and this is probably why we're where we are at today. Hey George, tell the viewers how we met. This is probably one of the most interesting situations with how you and I met. I mean, this, this is just, I, I honestly think it's like a one in a million chance. Like it doesn't, stuff like this doesn't really happen, right? Richard and I were following each other for, I'd probably say a good year before we actually made contact. We'd obviously get in each other's DMs, uh, D, DMs, uh, DMs. Uh, obviously with you building FJ45 Barra and me having Barra GU at the time, I think we spent a fair bit of time talking back and forth you know, on the internet as, as a lot of us do. One day I actually opened up my inbox and saw a message from, from Richard that basically said, hey man, where do you live? Like, I actually think I live next to you. And obviously me being a, a very, very private person online, I didn't really like to give out too much of my personal info. But you know, when, when someone says something like that to you, hey, you know, I think you live next to me, I was a bit perplexed with it all. So I was like, oh, look, you know, what, what makes you think that we live next to each other? Richard was like, you own a patrol and the guy behind me owns a patrol. You bought a Unimog and the dude behind me just bought a Unimog. So he was like, you know, where do you live? You sent me a screenshot, I think it was at the time, yeah. um, saying, oh, look, I live right here. And I've looked at him like, what the fuck? Like, that's right behind my fence. And he's like, oh, where do you live? And I sent him back a screenshot literally saying, right here. So literally lived right next to each other, I think for a year, speaking to each other in, on Instagram and absolutely had no idea until that particular moment. So we are neighbors, that's funny. Right. Funny enough. Um, as you can imagine, we obviously started hanging up pretty much all the time with Richard having this build going on in the background. As you'd expect, I was here a lot more. Uh, any opportunity, obviously, to get some me time away from the family and sort of swing spanners with him in the shed, I took. You know, really enjoyed his company, got along well, and uh, obviously, you know, bouncing some info back, back and forth with each other in regards to the build was pretty cool. He had this build going on, which was a pretty cool rig. And me being a patrol guy, it didn't really appeal to me at the time, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, yeah. you knew, I mean, you'd, it was like, it's like, you know, when someone comes up to you and says, oh, look, look what I've got. And you're like, dude, it's not a patrol. I don't care. Obviously, over time, there, there was a love there for old school cruisers as well. Tell us about Wild Dog. Bit different to Outback Challenge. So Wild Dog is actually a short course event which, uh, which takes place over a weekend. Wild Dog introduced a hugely anticipated uh, weekend warrior class which was open to street driven vehicles. So at the time I told Richard that I wanted to race Barrage U in this class and asked him if he wanted to obviously be my navvy. I was shocked at first when he turned around and turned down the offer. I couldn't understand why someone wouldn't want to do it. 
uh, truth be told, as you all know, Richard's a pretty busy bloke and he's got a lot of commitments obviously going on. At the time, Richard was uh, trying to complete the FJ45 build. He was doing a lot of filming and editing for his trips whilst also starting an online uh, business with Laurie from LCS 4x4. I kind of understood that it was gonna be a very difficult task to get him involved in it. Uh, somehow I ended up twisting his arm enough to obviously commit to it. Personally, I just think that the bloke didn't want to be in an actual patrol, but I mean, that's another story. In preparation to the actual event, uh, given the entries we're in and Richard had no choice but to obviously race it with me, Richard, Laurie and myself decided to give it a bit of a once over at LCS at the time. Because she hadn't been driven, I think, for about one and a half years uh, from that 24 hour challenge. It spent a lot of time on its side. It was pretty banged up. So literally what we did, we took it down to Laurie's factory. We, um, we changed some fluids, we slapped some stickers on it and that's how Zero Prep Racing was born. A lot of, a lot of the guys give me, give me grief obviously because I used to do very little maintenance to the car. So Zero Prep Racing sort of fit for that. First weekend warrior class was riddled with some serious off-road uh, off talent, as you know yourself. Um, and unfortunately, to no surprise at all, uh, Barrage was plagued with you know, serious electrical issues. But the biggest thing lingering in my head was the fact that Richard had never even used the winch before. It's probably a good time to level with you. I've never really done any four-wheel driving. And let alone knew anything about recovering a four-wheel drive vehicle. That actually came like a big shock to me. Because I was thinking to myself, here's this bloke in a shed building a pretty tough, you know, looking FJ45. I kind of feel like I threw him in the deep end that weekend. So for those of you that don't really know Richard on a personal scale, he's actually a pretty hard working bloke and he seems to have the ability to take on new things before you know it. Uh, he starts to excel in it. To see someone like him out of their comfort zone is actually quite humbling and remarkable. He knew absolutely nothing about wind truck racing and with a few good pointers from the likes of Jimmy Rooster and Burnsy, he was actually up there with the rest of them and you wouldn't have even known it before that weekend. One, Just got my footy studs on, three, ready to go winching in my skins. Five, I'm a mammal five. now. Has never greased the CVs in this car, he reckons. Hey. As much as I'd like to say Richard let us down that weekend, Barra GU was ultimately the problem which caused us to DNF four or five stages. Leaving Wild Dog that weekend for, for Richard and I gave us some pretty mixed emotions. On one hand, we were on an absolute high given we just spent the weekend racing you know, with some close mates and doing what we love. But on the other hand, we we're pretty gutted that you know, Barra GU let us down. So in the car ride home, Richard and I had plenty of time to reflect on the weekend's results. We're at top speed up this hill, sliding climb. 12, 12 kilometers an hour. 12 an hour. <laughs> Good for a lot of things, but not going fast. Both of us really enjoyed the experience, but it was at this moment that Richard said that if we were going to continue to do this, it wasn't going to actually be in Barrage AU. Without hesitation at the time, I did agree, and then knew that that was going to be the end of Barrage AU, so it was pretty much done. But it was Richard who ultimately said, if we're going to do this again, the only way I'd ever considered doing something like this it would have to be in a ground up build that we did ourselves and understood properly. Laurie from LCS had been pit crewing for me that weekend and the idea of building an FJ had rapidly grown on me after seeing the quality builds coming out of his actual workshop. When you think 40 series Land Cruisers, Laurie and his business are probably one of the best old school cruiser fab shops in Oz. So I'm actually very lucky to have him on board with me on this next build too. So here's a plan for the new build. We've stripped all the good bits out of Barrage AU and we're building an extremely capable 4x4 that we can throw at a cage one day and go racing. The drive line will be a built Barra and RE4 transmission, patrol transfer case and patrol diffs. Richard and Laurie have spent a lot of time developing parts for 80 series chassis. It's a no brainer to utilize one as they have a complete model in CAD. We'll be using an FJ45 cab, but because I'm a bit of a big bloke, uh, this one's gonna be an extra cab. So at this point, you're probably thinking we're just building another version of Richard's FJ. However, this is where the similarities end. 
We're going to be doing a significant amount of suspension and chassis work to this build, including triangulated four-link rear with 7075 aluminium links. I love the look of the style side, but I want the practicality of a comp tray off-road, and I'm still deciding on which direction to go, so watch this space. Richard and I will be doing the majority of the engine conversion in his shed, and it would be quite different to his as we are planning on rear mount radiator as it frees up a lot of space in the engine bay for things like a bigger intercooler. As we're using most of the same components, we're expecting similar horsepower figures to Barrow GU, which is around 700 horsepower at the hubs. Uh, we're also trying to leverage the resources available to us as best can be with this build. The majority of the chassis, suspension work and engine body mounting will be done at LCS, where we have access to hoist and the CNC plasma table. The car will eventually come back to Richard's shed to do the engine conversion and we'll be able to chip away at the rest of the build here. There's going to be a heap of custom fabrication as well as machining and we're going to try and document the build as best as we can. I'm actually really lucky to have Richard and Laurie in my corner on this build. If you've been following along, you'll know both of them have been making some pretty cool stuff to a high standard. We hope you guys enjoy the new series of my FJ45 Barra build and we cannot wait to get started to show you guys a pretty cool windstruck build from the ground up. Thank you. Yeah, George. High five. <laughs> Got a ton. <laughs> what is the part you're looking most forward to? I'd probably have to say doing a build from the ground up because it's something that I've never actually done before. I mean, we fiddle around with a lot of, you know, cars, putting, you know, doing engines and, you know, changing diffs and all that stuff. But to do a build from the ground up, like literally chassis, every nut, every bolt, that's pretty cool. What were some of the shortcomings of Barra GU that you hope to fix this time around? Very good question. I think it comes down to two things. Last time, one of the biggest issues I had with that car was the fact that someone else actually built it for me and I wasn't really involved in the build at all. You literally drove it into a workshop, drive in, drive out, you've got the build there. You know nothing about the vehicle if something goes wrong off-road. So the fact that we can actually build this from the ground up and I've got my eye and hands over the whole build, that's point one, which is really good, especially for racing or being in remote areas. And point number two would most probably have to be the electrical system. Uh, Barrett GU's electrical system wasn't the best. It was heavily unreliable. So having a system that's actually done custom made for the car is probably godsend for it. What word, like obviously we've got game changing, we've got wildest and we've got spicy. Yes. Like if you don't use one of those three words, I, we won't go big on YouTube. So what unique word are we coming up oh. with for the build? Is there bigger than game changing, really? <laughs> I don't know, I'd probably say leave it up to the audience. Tell us, what, what, what do they reckon? <laughs> Jokes aside, we're really excited about the new build and we can't wait to start dropping full build episodes because we put a lot of time in behind the scenes to the design of the new vehicle. So if you'd like to see more of the build, make sure you hit like and subscribe because this is very much a long-term project. So this is a really good visual representation of what we're doing. This is a new frame rail up here, and then this is the old one at the bottom. Now, when we chop out this bottom section,